a great pleasure and, and honor for me to be invited here to speak to, with you and have a discussion about the philosophy. Uh, I've been in Bogota now uh, three days and uh, I've really enjoyed the active philosophical life uh, that I found in the city. Um, uh, if Houston, Texas had so much going for it, it would be a better place to live. But uh, uh, I'm uh, very grateful for you to uh, share with me this uh, moment in uh, discussing philosophy. I, as you know, the, the text that I sent is very long, and I promise I'm not going to read it all. Um, the two uh, final sections are applications of an argument that I make in the first uh, three sections. So uh, I'll focus uh, on those three sections. And uh, if uh, people have read the other parts and want to discuss them, the section on uh, post-positivist uh, philosophy of science and the section on uh, Renaud Valeras uh, biocentrism, uh, I'll be happy to, to do that. Um, these both uh, are uh, in the paper because the project of the paper is, uh, roughly speaking, uh, a defense of a transcendental um, point of view in philosophy that uh, was established uh, in uh, recent times uh, in the phenomenological tradition by uh, Husserl and I argue was carried on uh, by Heidegger. And the uh, background of that transcendental move was uh, a reaction to uh, what Husserl called naturalism. And uh, interestingly, uh, the founding of phenomenology as a response to naturalism was uh, contem contemporaneous with the founding of analytic philosophy also as a response to naturalism. And what is interesting today is that both in uh, the phenomenological tradition and in the analytic tradition, uh, there is an attempt to develop uh, new naturalism. And um, I have my suspicions about it. I understand the motivations and uh, very interesting work is being done uh, in uh, those both of those uh, directions. But the point of my paper uh, today is to um, uh, raise some questions about uh, what we understand by uh, nature and life um, as we go forward, uh, moving away from a more restricted view that was the target of uh, both Husserl and uh, the, the founders of uh, conceptual analysis in the uh, Anglo-American tradition and uh, frame. Uh, so, uh, with your permission, I will simply uh, read the text, and um, uh, I'm hoping that it will uh, speak uh, for itself. But uh, if not, we'll have time for questions. Uh, first section, uh, Metaphysics and Transcendental Philosophy. As Hegel knew, uh, philosophical beginnings are hard. One cannot say everything at once, but to say anything is already to take a stand on issues that require justification. To presuppose something that should already have been said and justified. If one could presuppose certain things as given, quantum theory, for example, or the validity of the Mosaic law, one could simply deduce the consequences according to the problem at hand. But even if for pragmatic reasons this is how much of philosophy is done, it just postpones the day of reckoning. In philosophy, nothing is simply given. At least that's the presupposition with which I'll begin here. And since it forms the background of my approach to transcendental life, it deserves some preliminary discussion. Viewed at a sufficiently high level of abstraction, there are, there are two ways to think about the kind of inquiry that philosophy is, the metaphysical way and the transcendental way. The metaphysical way is characterized by methodological monism. The goal of such thinking is, as Rorty following Sellers aptly put it, to see how things in the largest sense of the term hang together in the largest sense of the term. The fact that one of those things, the philosopher, is carrying out that very inquiry is an interesting fact 
that will be woven into the account of things in various ways, but it will not have any methodological significance. That is, it will not constrain the resulting account in the sense of providing in advance a characterization of the subject matter of philosophy. Thus, that human beings do philosophy will just be part of human nature, where the nature of nature will be filled in by the metaphysical count itself, in terms of monads, or entelechies, or potensum, or atoms in the void, or whatever. Both Aristotle and Quine are metaphysicians in this sense. In what follows, I will argue that this way of doing philosophy leads to deep ambiguities taking aim at the naturalism which, in both continental and analytic philosophy, seems to be the metaphysical consensus of our time. The transcendental way of thinking about the kind of inquiry philosophy is, on the other hand, is characterized by methodological pluralism. On this approach, the fact that human beings do philosophy places a methodological constraint on how we must conceive the topic of philosophy. Whatever may become the theme of philosophical interest must, on the transcendental view, be understood as the correlate of a specific sort of inquiry, an inquiry whose structures, rules, and aims provide necessary conditions without which we cannot so much as identify what we are inquiring into. And if there are different sorts of inquiry, everyday, scientific, philosophical, then it will not be possible simply to identify the things at issue in one with the things at issue in the others. That human beings do philosophy, for instance, will have different essential features depending on whether one approaches that fact biologically, psychologically, sociologically, or philosophically. In what follows, I will defend a version of this transcendental way, arguing that a philosophical approach to human beings doing philosophy precludes the sort of metaphysical naturalism that I mentioned above. Specifically, if there are philosophical or transcendental conditions that make inquiry into nature or life possible, then these conditions define what it is to be the inquirer in question. They make up its nature. And if there are other ways of inquiring into the entity who inquires, for instance, scientific or metaphysical ones, then the relation between their findings and transcendental philosophy will be determinable only through the latter, precisely because metaphysical and scientific inquiries are inquiries. It is therefore not possible to treat the inquirer simply as part of a whole, nature or life, that is given somehow independently of the inquiry. To put it in the form of a thesis, in philosophy, what it is to be a human being cannot be determined independently of the ability to philosophize. And that means independently of my own ability to philosophize, since a general concept of human being is not available in advance. The transcendental conditions of inquiry thus have some deep connection to the first person's stance, where the latter cannot be defined as part of some greater whole accessible in third person terms. This last point leads us to phenomenology, the ph philosophical movement inaugurated by Edmund Husserl and developed significantly by Martin Heidegger, both of whom I will treat here as paradigms of the transcendental way of thinking. The term transcendental life in my title refers to the determination of the philosophical inquirer that should allow us to understand the connection between philosophical inquiry and science, the inquirer and the human being. In turning to the phenomenological approach, it will be quite impossible to explicate all the concepts that would bear on this question. I will instead try to bring out its distinctive features by constructing a schema of transcendental phenomenology that can encompass both Husserl and Heidegger, one that holds even in the face of their undeniable differences. To do so, I will consider uh, two related questions, not three. Uh, what constitutes the methodological indispensability of the first person stance? And how does this determine a phenomenological approach to the polysemic notion of life? So I now skip the, uh, to the section two. Uh, 
So section two, uh, intentionality, the indispensability of the first person point of view. In what then does the methodological priority of the first person point of view consist? As is well known, Husserl arrived at his transcendental phenomenology through a critique of logical psychologism, the view that the validity of logical laws can be explained by treating them as functions of thinking conceived as a mental process, the sort of thing studied by the natural science of psychology. Though there have been many sophisticated versions of this idea, Husserl's general objection is that any such approach leads to skepticism or relativism, since it entails that logical laws could change. As nothing but high-level empirical generalities, such laws might, through further psychological research, be found not to exist, or else they might evolve into other laws as the species changes over time. In either case, Husserl argues, such a theory undermines its own coherence as a theory, since its status as scientific knowledge depends not only on individual propositions, but also on the explanatory form in which those propositions stand toward one another, a form that presupposes the validity of logical laws. In contrast to those like Thomas Nagel, or in Husserl's time, Paul Nator, who conclude from this that no philosophical clarification of uh, logical validity is possible, Husserl proposed that the holding, or Geltung, of logical laws can be clarified if one reflects phenomenologically on the me uh, mental processes of thinking. That is, if one takes the first person experience of thinking and reasoning as the starting point for an elucidation of logic under the normative perspective of claims to truth. To Nator, Husserl's position here seemed psychologistic, but Husserl insisted that reflection on the, the field of mental processes could yield necessities. For instance, to judge that the rose bush on my porch has red blossoms may, in a given empirical case, be nothing more than to formulate some words in a language, to, to think significantly, significantly in terms of signs alone and thus emptily about something of which I have no direct knowledge. However, when considered in what Husserl calls its essence as a judgment, such a mental process normatively entails a possible fulfillment, one that, in this case, would take place in direct perception of the rose bush. Thus, while there is no necessary empirical connection between the signative mental process and some perceptual mental process that might or might not occur subsequently in my stream of consciousness, there is nevertheless a necessary connection of meaning, a normative law that links such signative processes to perceptual ones. When grasped as governed by the norm of truth, an act of thinking is, as Husserl puts it, teleologically oriented toward what fulfills it. And it is only this normative aspect that allows such a signative act to fail, that is, to be incorrect. Such normative assessment would be unintelligible if thinking were considered solely as an empirically occurring mental process. This is the basic idea behind Husserl's notion of intentionality or intentional content. And from it, he develops a universal transcendental phenomenology of consciousness. For it is a small step from the idea that the signative act, such as thinking, have a sense, uh, have a sense that is teleologically oriented toward fulfillment, to the idea that all conscious acts can be understood in this way. Consider perception, for instance. When I perceive that the rose bush on my porch has red blossoms, my perception of it has a certain content. It is about the rose bush, not in some general way but precisely as having red blossoms. Under a certain description, we might say, though no active description need be involved. Though only a part of the bush is directly visible to me, the perceptual content presents the bush as a whole. Such content is thus norm-governed in a very specific way. It can fail. What it purports to present in that way can prove not to be so. A closer look can show that it is not a real rose bush, but a hallucination or plastic, or that it is not determined as it seems. For instance, its blossoms are brown, not red. 
What makes this possible belongs to the phenomenological essence of perception, namely, that it is teleologically oriented toward further acts of perception that would either fulfill, that is, confirm its content, or alter it or destroy it, that is, disconfirm it. This is not a contingent fact. It constitutes what it is to be perceptual content. Considered first personally, any perceptual content is oriented normatively toward certain determinate possibilities of success or failure. And if that is so, then there are not merely empirical regularities governing first person experience, but normative necessities. I cannot have the perceptual experience as of a rose bush without being in some sense beholden to the norms that establish what subsequent experience must be like if the thing actually is a rose bush. Husserl made this point at the basis of his transcendental phenomenology. As he put it in his programmatic essay of 1911, Philosophy as Rigorous Science, philosophy has a critical orientation toward experience. It is not concerned with questions of fact, but with questions of possibility. Quote, how is experience as consciousness, uh, how can, excuse me, how can experience as consciousness give or contact an object? How can experiences be mutually legitimated or corrected by means of each other and not merely replace each other? End quote. That mental processes have this feature is indisputable, as the above examples show. Nor can the answer to such questions be supplied by third-person theories, such as a causal theory of reference or reliabilism, since the confirmation takes place within experience. It must therefore belong to the essence of what consciousness is. Later in the same essay, Husserl makes this point in a vivid way. Quote, everything psychical is ordered in an overall connection, in a monadic unity of consciousness, a unity that in itself has nothing at all to do with nature, with space and time, or substantiality and causality, but has its own thoroughly peculiar forms. End quote. A psychological inquiry treats consciousness in its extrinsic relation to nature, taking mental processes as empirical occurrences. But another or critical point of view is possible because consciousness is itself normatively ordered, thanks to the peculiar forms that govern intentional content. <laughs> Phenomenological philosophy, then, thematizes consciousness as the lo uh, locus of the constitution of the content uh, or meaning, zin. The distinctive character of transcendental, uh, the transcendental standpoint in phenomenology derives from this notion of meaning. First, by showing how anything like confrontation, confirmation and disconfirmation is possible in experience, how there can be normative relations between entities of whatever sort, phenomenological reflection on meaning articulates the validity conditions of all other inquiries. In order to express this point methodologically, Husserl invokes the epoche, the bracketing of any assumptions derived from other inquiries, whether scientific or everyday, the refusal to assume their findings as the basis for philosophical constructions. Second, the focus on meaning exemplifies the transcendental thesis that entities can be considered only as correlates of the inquiries or experiences in which they are given. As Husserl puts it, quote, in a certain way, we can say that all real unities are unities of meaning. For instance, quote, reality and world are names here precisely for certain valid unities of meaning related to certain concatenations of absolute, of pure consciousness. And if I can experience or inquire into it, it is there for me as something, and I can reflect on the normative forms that constitute it precisely as the thing it is. In order to express this point methodologically, Husserl invokes the transcendental phenomenological reduction, which focuses reflection not on consciousness in the sense of inner experiences, nor on its objects as things in the world, but precisely on the correlation in which the phenomenon of meaning the as structure of experience becomes salient. 
Taken together, the epoche and reduction express the methodological priority of the first person point of view. What meaning is shows up only for an inquirer who takes his or her own experience in its intentional structure as the field of inquiry. And since meaning in this sense is presupposed in all other inquiries as their enabling condition, it cannot be directly identified with the entities thematized in those inquiries. In particular, it cannot be identified with a mental entity or representation, but neither can it be identified with a process in the brain, a social structure, or language. Thus, despite its methodological commitment to first-person experience, phenomenology is nothing subjective. There is no meaning without consciousness and its teleological correlations, but nor is there meaning without things in the world, since to speak of meaning is just to speak of that very teleology in its function of disclosing what it is to be a thing of such and such a sort, given in such and such a way. The transcendental subject, the one who inquires in this way, is thus defined in terms of its disclosure or constitution of a world in which it too is somehow involved. But this raises a significant question. Is Husserl's conception of consciousness, that is, phenomenal consciousness, sufficient to characterize such a subject, such an inquiry? Heidegger, for instance, argued that it is inconceivable that phenomenal consciousness alone could possess the normative teleology Husserl attributed to it. On my reading, Heidegger accepted the main tenets of Husserl's transcendental turn, the methodological primacy of the first person stance, the reduction to meaning, which he called being, and the corresponding insistence on correlation. In his language, there is no entity without an understanding of being. But he made a crucial discovery about the kind of inquirer capable of experiencing teleological or normative relations of meaning. In addition to being conscious, such an inquirer must be an issue for itself. Dasein, Heidegger's name for the inquirer from the transcendental point of view, is, quote, a being in whose very being that being is an issue. In other words, for intentional content to be accessible in terms of success or failure, the entity which is intentional uh, must, uh, in being at all, be able to assess itself in that way, that is, in normative terms. Being a self is thus a success term. Consciousness simply is or is not. Dasein, in contrast, can succeed or fail at being itself. Let us, be, uh, uh, let us briefly look at what this determination of the transcendental subject adds to Husserl's account of meaning. Heidegger's account of intentionality begins not with perception or judgment, but with the way things show up for us in our everyday practical dealings with them. <clears throat> this has led some to claim that Heidegger substitutes the primacy of practice for Husserl's alleged emphasis on theoretical experience. But Heidegger is quite clear that this is not the point. In a lecture course entitled Metaphysical Foundations of Logic, he writes that, quote, one cannot pack transcendence, which is his term for the transcendental subject, into a, an intuition as Husserl apparently did in his conception of transcendental reflection, but even less can it be packed into a practical comportment. Rather, starting with practical comportment serves the purpose of revealing a condition on the content of experience that precedes both theory and practice, namely existential death, a condition of the transcendental subject that enables it to disclose things not merely in accord with norms but in light of them. Intentional content for Heidegger depends on a being who is able to grasp the possible as possible, the normative as normative, measure as measure. This calls for a bit of explanation. In my practical dealings with them, things show up as useful in various ways, and this instrumentality constitutes what they are. For instance, a hammer is good for driving nails, which in turn are good for joining boards, which in turn are good for constructing frames, and so on. 
The point of putting things this way is to emphasize that things show up as meaningful and that they do so because they are apprehended in light of norms. But what, uh, what is the source of this normative ordering? It does not adhere to the things themselves considered in isolation. Rather, it depends on what Heidegger calls the work to be done. Because I'm making a birdhouse, things show up as hammers, nails, slats, that is, as appropriate for the job. If I were making a real house, this tiny little hammer and these tiny little nails that are perfect for the birdhouse would not be useful at all. They would not be good for the job. They would fail at being what they're supposed to be. But even the work to be done does not sufficiently determine the kind of normativity that informs experience of something as an implement in this sense. Hammers and nails of a certain sort are appropriate for making a birdhouse because making one can itself be done well or badly. That is, because there can be good birdhouses and bad ones. But suppose I use a sledgehammer to drive a bunch of very large nails into some random pieces of wood in a shape that resembles a very ugly and drafty birdhouse. Have I failed in making a birdhouse or succeeded in making a piece of sculpture? Nothing in what I've produced can help us decide this. The only thing that decides what I'm making is what I'm trying to make. And this, in turn, depends on what I'm trying to be. As Heidegger puts it, the totality of involvements, or the normative relational whole that includes the implements and the work to be done, itself goes back to a towards which, in which there is no further involvement, that is, no further relation to other things that would determine what is good for what. Rather, it goes back to a for the sake of which, un villain, which always pertains to the being of Dasein, for which, in its being, that very being is essentially an issue. What does all this mean? What decides, okay, so what decides whether uh, what I've produced is a bad birdhouse or a good sculpture is the fact that I'm doing it either for the sake of being a carpenter or for the sake of being an artist, whether I'm trying to be one or the other. And what I'm trying to be does not depend on other entities in the world, but only, as Heidegger puts it, on what is at issue in what I'm doing. Only because being one or the other matters to me, is at stake for me, can things present themselves as good for this or that. And only because uh, they can be, and only thus, can they be what they are. What it is or means to be a hammer or nails or whatever ultimately turns on relations of this kind. That is, on there being some entity in the world for whom its own being is normatively at stake. Because I can succeed or fail at being a carpenter or an artist, things can succeed or fail at being what they are. This analysis, of course, raises many questions. For instance, about the relationship between transcendental phenomenology and a certain idealism. But we cannot stop to consider them here. Rather, we must note that in Heidegger's phenomenology, the point is fully universal. It might appear that the analysis holds only for tools and other artifacts that are made for the, uh, some purpose by human hands. Can it be said that things in general, things of nature, for instance, can succeed at or fail at being what they are only because Dasein can succeed or fail at being this or that? To answer yes is precisely to acknowledge Heidegger's commitment to the transcendental way in philosophy, namely the insistence that what things are, their meaning, the truth of their being, cannot be determined apart from a normative framework that allows them to show up as this or that specific thing. We shall consider some implications of this in the next section, but for now we simply note that if we experience something as something at all, whether as an event, or a mystery, or a mere thing, or a quark, or a living thing, or whatever, then it is thanks to a normative context that must go back to something I am trying to be, some way in which I, as a father, teacher, penitent, physicist, artist, am engaged with the stakes of success or failure, something in which it matters to me whether I do it well or badly. Only this mattering 
or what John Hoagland calls my being beholden to norms, my commitment to them, allows things to show up in ways that are either acceptable or unacceptable, thus introducing into experience the very possibility of the kind of teleological orientation toward confirmation or disconfirmation upon which Husserl's account of intentionality is based. But one further aspect must be addressed if we are to see how all this bears on the question of transcendental life. For one might object that Heidegger's is not a transcendental position at all, since the norms that govern trying to be a father, a physicist, a teacher, and so on, are social facts. And thus, that meaning is here reduced to something factual, and perhaps ultimately natural. But while it is true that such norms are indeed social, as Heidegger puts it, success or failure at being something, father, teacher, or friend, cannot be divorced entirely from what one does, social roles. I myself am not uh, identical to any of these roles or practical identities. The deepest point about the self being a success term lies in the fact that I, I am such that I can still be without being anything. This ultimately explains the indispensability of the first person stance, and is Heidegger's deepest contribution to the analysis of meaning. Here I can only sketch the point. That I can be without being anything is attested in the unitary phenomenon that Heidegger considers under the separate headings of angst, death, and conscience. The upshot is these are the unitary forms of what he calls the care structure, the Dazen. The uh, upshot is that the uh, in anxiety, I confront myself as not beholden to any of the norms and practices that normally claim me. Affectively, nothing matters to me. I cannot gear into the world through any of my practical identities, and for this reason, the world and things in the world lose all significance. The way I understand myself in such a situation, my ultimate for the sake of which, is what Heidegger calls existential death. Not the demise of my organism, but as he defines it, the possibility of no longer being able to be there. The possibility of being without being able to be uh, anything, a Zion kernel. This sense of what it is for me to be, that for the sake of which I am in existential death, is articulated in what Heidegger calls conscience as guilt, which he glosses as, quote, having to take over being a ground. I apologize for all this Heidegger jargon, but um, I'm going to try to clarify it in a minute. Thus, when all my practical identities have fallen away, I still exist for the sake of something at which I can succeed or fail. I am still responsible for being a ground. What this means, I suggest, is that I am called to take over my situation, or thrownness, in light of what is best. That is, in light of normative measure. In the essay from Wesen des Bundes, uh, Heidegger makes this point explicit by referring to Plato's idea of the good. Quote, the essence of the agathon lies in its sovereignty over its lies in its sovereignty over itself as the for the sake of which. To be for the sake of something at all is to be oriented toward a normative distinction between what merely is and what is best that is, to be responsible for that distinction. What is ultimately at stake for Dasein, then, is a distinction between authentically inhabiting a practical identity by trying to live up to its norms as sheer, excuse me. What is ultimately at stake for Dasein, then, is a distinction between inauthentically inhabiting a practical identity by trying to live up to its norms as sheer givens, or what one does, or else authentically trying to be what one is by acknowledging that in my commitment to those norms, I am responsible for their normative force. What it means to be a father or a friend is not something I merely try to conform to. It is at issue, in question, in what I do. In this way, as Hoagland has convincingly shown, I not only let things be or show up as this or that, I'm also open to the possibility that things can show up that are deemed impossible according to the prevailing norms in light of which I'm acting. 
thus requiring me to give up or radically modify those very norms. The possibility of existential death is thus also the possibility of objectivity. That is, of distinguishing between the way things show themselves and the way things are. Despite the fact that things can show up as they are only as the correlates of specific practices, inquiries, and other normative frameworks. To summarize the claims I've argued for in this section, Heidegger advances over Husserl not by uh, abandoning transcendental phenomenology, but by showing that the normativity inherent in the teleological ordering of consciousness cannot derive from consciousness alone. As we shall see, the theme of transcendental life takes on importance for Husserl as he too moves away from a focus on phenomenal consciousness toward a transcendental subject that is embodied, practical, and social. But, as Heidegger, but Heidegger goes further. The transcendentally determined subject must be characterized as intrinsically suspended between success and failure, at issue in everything it does. Intentional content is possible only for a being defined not by reason, but by care. But aren't all living beings, or at any rate all the higher ones, defined in this way? Don't all living beings care about their own being, concerned as they are with survival? And doesn't that concern carry over to a concern for the success or failure of the construction of their nests, the raising of their offspring, and other such things? Isn't it clear that the teleological structures of consciousness derive from life itself? Shouldn't we then fold Heidegger's arcane transcendental phenomenology back into something much more familiar, a philosophy of life, thereby avoiding dubious transcendental theories and joining forces with the emerging metaphysical consensus that life and nature provide the horizon for understanding everything, including the inquiries into life and nature that Husserl held to be in need of transcendental phenomenological clarification. It's time to take up our second guiding question. How is the polysemic concept of life to be approached phenomenologically? Uh, so uh, determining life transcendentally. This question is all the more pressing since both Husserl and the early Heidegger sometimes adopt the term life to characterize the transcendental subject itself. This is understandable since in contrast to the Kantian idea of the transcendental subject as a formal unity of apperception, phenomenology attains its notion of self or subject through a non-formal reflection on consciousness or being in the world, that is, on experience as lived. But if, as we have argued, transcendental phenomenology defines the subject wholly in terms of the conditions necessary for the constitution of meaning, what condition does the term life add to that definition? What aspect, among all the candidates in the term semantic field, comes into play when Husserl describes transcendentally reduced consciousness as transcendental life? In his uh, late work, The Crisis, for instance, uh, Husserl characterizes the distinction between transcendental philosophy and all other inquiry, everyday, scientific, and metaphysical, by invoking uh, Helmholtz's image of the life of the plane where two-dimensional creatures lead their lives entirely unaware of the third dimension that sustains them, and the life of death, which, on this image, is the transcendental consciousness that constitutes or discloses the meaning of what is experienced on the plane. To reflect phenomenologically on this dimension is to enjoy what he calls a completely different sort of waking life from the one in which I do not attend to the necessary correlation between consciousness and its objects. To become cog uh, it, it is to become cognizant of the, quote, universal accomplishing life in which the world comes to be as existing for us. But what does the term life add here to the transcendental determination of consciousness as a teleological unity? Does it entail that such consciousness must be an organism or have a certain kind of DNA, be part of nature conceived as a nexus of substances in space and time, closed under causal laws, be historical? If we are to avoid Rickert's judgment that life is the concept for what lacks a concept, we must admit that the concept of life is extraordinarily vague or polysemic. 
precisely the sort of meaning that's supposed to be clarified phenomenologically by returning to its no doubt complex sources in the constitutive achievements of transcendental consciousness. Husserl is quite clear that life at issue here cannot be understood as though consciousness were a, the human soul. Transcendental life is not defined by starting with consciousness as a part of the concrete natural unity human being, since rejection of this idea is the crux of Husserl's solution to the paradox of human subjectivity. Were life understood as human subjectivity, then the concept of transcendental life would entail that, quote, the subjective part of the world swallows up, so to speak, the whole world, and thus itself, too. What an absurdity. If one sticks rigorously to the transcendental perspective, on the contrary, in which human being is a constitutive meaning, then in, quote, the transcendental subjects, that is, those functioning in the consti uh, constitution of the world, nothing human is to be found, neither soul nor psychic life nor real psychophysical human beings. This claim is nothing but a paradoxical way of expressing our thesis. A consistent transcendental phenomenology will not presuppose some conception of human being, but will define the transcendental subject exclusively in terms of what shows itself as a necessary condition for the constitution of meaning. Because this thesis introduces no metaphysical distinction, however, it might be argued that because the human inquirer is alive, the transcendental subject must also be alive. But this just allows the question to reemerge. Whence comes this determination, life, and what does it add to our understanding? Before addressing this point specifically, it should be noted that the same issue arises in Heidegger's earliest texts, and his way of handling it, more consistent than Husserl's, is instructive. Much has been made of the fact that prior to writing Being in Time, Heidegger uses the term factic life to distinguish the topic of his phenomenology from Husserl's reflection on consciousness. It is tempting to tell the following story about this. Heidegger dismisses Husserl's transcendental project and with it its paradoxes in favor of a metaphysical appeal to a simply given concept of life, that is, one that eludes any methodological preformation. What is significant about such factic life is that it generates categories whose sense derives from living itself. The task of philosophy, itself an accomplishment of factic life, is to identify the categories in which life expresses itself, comes to itself interpretively. Categories are, in his language that I can't translate, uh, im Leben selbst am Leben. Life also accomplishes science through a kind of objectification, but since this differs from the non-objectifying way in which life understands itself, philosophy cannot be the sort of theoretical inquiry that science is. Instead, it is an obscurely characterized hermeneutic intuition that seeks to illuminate life from within by attending to the way it understands itself in all its other accomplishments. A closer look at Heidegger's approach to life here, however, reveals that the concept plays no role that could mark a break with the transcendental conception of phenomenology defended by Husserl. First, it might be expected that if Heidegger were adopting a non-transcendental or metaphysical position, he would join forces with then-current philosophical anthropology, which, drawing upon the life sciences, tries to construct a speculative account of man's place in nature, or to define man's extrinsic positionality, Helmut Plessner, vis-a-vis all other life forms. But Heidegger is not drawn to this sort of project since it starts with the positive sciences and so remains in the grip of a the theoretical attitude which, according to him, in its very objectification of life, misses life's defining character. Uh, yeah. For Heidegger, uh, Husserl's objection to naturalism does not go far enough. The real problem, according to him, is the general dominance of the theoretical itself. The life sciences, no matter how construed, do not provide the basic categories for understanding life, according to Heidegger in his early lectures. In this respect, Heidegger embraces Leibniz's philosophy, uh, Nietzsche and Bergson, uh, uh, in a qualified way. Though the concept of life is confused, he says, and ambiguous, the genuine tendencies of such 
Leiden's philosophy, uh, is correct. So how then does Heidegger propose to disambiguate this notion? According to Heidegger, the phenomenological approach to life seeks the categories that render it intelligible. And the primary category that captures the oriented directness of the movement of life is world. What characterizes the specifically philosophical category of life is its worldly character. World here does not mean nature or cosmos. <clears throat> Rather, it belongs to life itself, a thesis that Heidegger spells out in terms of a correlation between two further categories, care, Zorin, and significance, Bedeutsamkeit. Care is the relational sense, roughly the subjective or noetic correlate of life, and significance is its content sense, roughly the objective or nomadic correlate. When factic life grasps its own life in its everyday feelings, it is not as a biological kind, but as concerned, troubled, caring about things in the world. Nor are the categories by which it pre-theoretically grasps its world drawn from science. Rather, they formally indicate the normative context of first-person experience, significance. But care and significance are the very terms in which Heidegger defines Dasein and world in being and time. Thus, conceptually, life, the term life, adds nothing to the transcendental approach Heidegger embraces explicitly in the later text. Once Heidegger defines Dasein in a strictly transcendental way, as that being in whose being that very being is an issue for it, he drops the term life altogether, and it never reappears in a philosophically significant role in any of his subsequent writings. In being in time, Heidegger is adamant that the analytic of Dasein must be distinguished from all biology, anthropology, and psychology, that is, from any sciences of life. There is a connection between philosophy and life. He says the expression of philosophy of life says about as much as the botany of plants. But one cannot begin with the notion of life, since in doing so, quote, life itself as a kind of being does not become ontologically a problem. And more generally, uh, he connects life to nature and argues that from the transcendental point of view, the nature by which we are surrounded is an entity within the world, whose meaning thus always presupposes Dasein's capacity to disclose the world through its normative commitments. Consideration of both Husserl and Heidegger thus leads to the following conclusion. Whatever life means in the phrase transcendental life, must be determined from within the transcendental point of view itself. It cannot be borrowed from any of the polysemic uses one finds in the natural attitude or the life of the plane, whether from biology or cybernetics or from ordinary poetical or metaphysical Aristotelian conceptions of life and nature. Transcendental life will then be the ultimate basis upon which other notions of life can be determined. But while Heidegger was consistent on this point, Husserl's approach involves an ambiguity that some later ph uh, phenomenological projects have tried to exploit in an effort to circumvent the transcendental altogether. Let us consider this ambiguity briefly and then bring this uh, to a close. Husserl clearly saw that most, if not all, the meanings that supported the life of the plane refer back to an embodied consciousness. For instance, to be perceptually aware of my rose bush as such is to be aware of the side that is not currently visible as that which would be visible were I to exercise my ability to move around it to get a better look. This normative condition is not a thought. Thinking that I could move around to the back presupposes the very meaning in question. It is an ability that I must be able to exercise. In the life of the plane, we will say that this ability belongs to my body. But how is body understood here? On the one hand, we may think of it theoretically as what Husserl calls körper, a physical thing among others in nature. On the other hand, we may think of it as what Husserl calls the animate organism, the body taken as ensouled or living. This too belongs to nature. Lizards and cats, as well as human beings, are animate organisms. But from the transcendental point of view, both of these conceptions involve presuppositions that go beyond what is necessarily entailed by the meaning-constituting ability that I, as transcendental subject, exercise. 
As Husserl demonstrates in Ideas 2, both physical body and animate organism are themselves constituted meanings. The body that is involved in constitution, in contrast, is understood exclusively in terms of that meaning constituting ability itself. Husserl's term uh, for the body in this sense is live, or lived body. The body as experienced in transcendentally reduced first person experience. This notion of the body is supremely important in Husserl's phenomenology, serving as the basis for his account of inner subjectivity and thus the whole realm of sociocultural meaning. But it raises questions about the concept of transcendental life. To what extent does embodiment in this sense authorize treating life as something like the horizon of the transcendental project, something which the latter presupposes but cannot get back behind? Alternatively, if we say that the transcendental subject is embodied, social, and practical, haven't we already located it within a conceptual field that includes animals? Other animals, if you want to put it that way. Uh, will this not entail that animality itself is a transcendental condition on meaning? The answer, as Heidegger recognized, must be no. One cannot infer from the analysis of the lived body that lizards or cats are indeed embodied. One cannot infer that they are not embodied either. Rather, the whole question of what it means to be embodied now takes on the contours of the distinction between the life of the plane and the life of death. Cats and lizards show up as animate organisms, and I too, as a human being, show up as an animate <coughs> organism. But this provides no grounds for asserting that any of us show up as transcendentally constituting life since live is defined in functional terms as a necessary condition on a certain kind of normatively structured meaning. And as Heidegger's analysis of existential death shows, such meaning is possible only for a being who is oriented toward measure as measure, and thus can succeed or fail at being itself, or a self. Thus, embodiment in the sense of live as a transcendentally constitutive condition can provide no reason to think that the transcendental project itself must be understood within the horizon of a metaphysics of life. But how then are we to think about life phenomenologically? If we adhere to the thesis that meaning can only be explicated from the transcendental standpoint, then there are only two uh, consistent approaches to take toward the polysemic notion of life, one of which leads inevitably to the other. And I'll just discuss these two in, in First, we make, uh, the first we may call the regional approach, and the second the privative approach. The first is found already in Kant. Just as Kant determined the root cognitive meaning of nature by uncovering the a priori principles presupposed in Newtonian physics, so one might turn to the life sciences to seek out the theoretical concepts and laws that define their object field, life. Phenomenological analysis would then show how such concepts gain their validity. Both Husserl and Heidegger call this project uh, of uh, call this the project of regional ontology. The various sciences presuppose a certain meaning or regional essence that defines what they take their object of study to be. Such meanings are not thematic objects of scientific inquiry, but belong to what Kuhn would call the paradigm of the science in question. Phenomenology reflects on these mostly tacit conceptual connections, clarifying the logical and intentional implications that are at stake in their employment. As when, in Ideas 2, Husserl reflects on the constitution of the domain material nature, that is, the regional ontology of physics. In this way, phenomenology spells out the normative commitments of the sciences in question. A similar strategy could be pursued in less theoretically defined areas of experience as well. When we speak of the life of an accountant, for instance, we mean to pick out what normatively distinguishes this practice and role from others, and perhaps make a value judgment about its relative regimentation in uh, relation to other such roles. And we can uh, reflect on the way that living and life are understood in various cultures, or how nature is understood in different historical periods. All that is necessary for such regional ontologies is a sufficiently rich descriptive characterization of the beliefs and practices in which such meanings are embedded. 
This sort of broadly construed regional approach simply expresses the phenomenological commitment to correlation. Meaningful reference, that is, identification of something as alive or as natural, always involves the context of practices and discourses whose normative forms make such reference possible. In the case of the term life, however, the regional approach raises an issue that cannot be addressed by its means, thus leading necessarily to the privative approach. Consider the case of a regional ontology of the science of biology. Unless it is a biology whose paradigm involves the idea that the biological can ultimately be reduced to physics and chemistry, its way of identifying its proper object, life as organism, or life or organism, will invoke teleological concepts and explanations. But where does one find the phenomenological ground for this sort of meaning? Heidegger argued that a judgment that something is there in order to do something, that is, is good for something, can have a determinate meaning only if grounded in an entity that is intrinsically responsive to norms as norms. Only such a being is capable of the first-person responsibility for normative force upon which definite reference to something as something depends. But this suggests that observation of animate organisms cannot provide the grounds for the teleological judgments that pervade the biological sciences. Rather, the paradigm or regional ontology of a biology that invokes teleological explanations must ultimately make reference to my own experience, my own transcendental life, as a being for whom, in its being, that being is essentially at issue. This is the essence of the privative approach. I can only think phenomena of non-transcendental life as privations, or perhaps better, modifications, of my own transcendentally determined life. I can employ teleological modes of explanation uh, in understanding non-human animals, not because I recognize that they and I share an ontological region, life, but because I constitute them as possessing abilities that I possess, but privatively, or in a modified form. Even if, objectively, I can know that they also possess certain abilities, sonar na navigation, for instance, that I do not. Both Husserl and Heidegger employ this privative strategy. When reflecting on the life world, for instance, Husserl argues that animals present themselves as, quote, modifications of my fully human being, which serves as a norm. In order to grasp the world they inhabit, we, we start from, quote, the, uh, from the primordial mode, human being, and work in an imperfect way by means of intentional modifications to an understanding of how their experiences and ours go to make up one world. Husserl's remarks entail, the remark entails that we experience the life around us in this primitive way, that animality has necessary connections of meaning to what we experience ourselves as being. And if that is true, then any account that starts with the phenomena of life in the hope of avoiding the supposed subjectivism of transcendental phenomenology will simply reflect unknowingly this primitive constitution. It is built into the meaning of our experience. The primitive approach is also evident in Heidegger's work. In Being and Time, he writes uh, that, quote, life must be understood as a kind of being to which there belongs a being in the world. Only if this kind of being is oriented in a primitive way to Dasein can we fix its character ontologically. This approach led him in 1930 uh, to conceive of uh, animal life not as worldless, but as world poor. Weltman. Clearly, animals are not mere things. We experience, we experience them as instinctively responding to what we would call normative distinctions, acting in accord with something like a teleology. But we have no ground for thinking that these norms are at stake in their experience. And without that, the necessary condition for world is missing. Indeed, Heidegger argues that despite our embodiment, there is an abyss between us and animals. Because of our orientation toward measure as measure, we are closer to the divinities than the beasts. Examples could be multiplied. Whether all this adds up to an objectionable humanism, as has been alleged, cannot be decided here. But it is clear that Heidegger offers no approach to the phenomenon of life beyond the regional and the primitive. 
And uh, with that, I'll just end this uh, section because uh, the following discussions concern two uh, uh, contemporary movements that try to uh, pose uh, uh, an approach to nature and life that uh, doesn't reflect either of these um, regional ontologies or uh, primitive approach. And my point is that uh, they don't work or they run into trouble. So thank you very much. Thank you.